there are a lot of people in the wider ASD community and AD community, chronic fatigue community. I want to thank you uh, through me for all the work and kindness and support that you have shown so many people that are ill or have an ill child. So I want to hand over to you now um, for you to introduce yourself. So welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Oh, hi there, Tony. So I've had a potted history which has led me to this. So it, I um, worked on B12 a long time ago. I was involved in cloning intrinsic factor. I used vitamin B12 as a targeting agent for, drug, for oral drug delivery. And then I serendipitously came across the topical delivery system for B12. At that stage, I knew nothing about autism. I knew nothing about chronic fatigue, knew nothing about the symptoms so, or what caused it. So I came into it with a completely open and blank mind about it. I did have a lot of time on my hands, so I could use, I could look at a lot of things. The first organic acids test I got, I looked at, I said, oh, okay, what's all this about? And that was with chronic fatigue. Then I got more and more and more of them. And then I realized I didn't have any controls because all of my data was from people who were sick. So I then spent quite a bit of money getting control data. And so then I could start to analyze it to see where the differences were and to try and understand the markers. In chronic fatigue and in autism, people, uh, because they don't know what it is, have done lots of tests. And so they had lots of tests available to send to me for me to look at it and then for me to try and look at what was going on. And so that's where I came to look, to start to group the data from autism and group the data from chronic fatigue. And then basically I could see, well, looks like B12 deficiency. And so then I came up with this, it looks like B12 deficiency, but B12 levels are normally high, which is probably what we found as well and what most people find. So then I had to find out a mechanism for that, and that's where we came across the fact that in functional B2 deficiency, vitamin B12 doesn't cycle properly, and it gradually becomes inactivated. And so serum B12 levels are very high. And then going through the elementary biochemistry that's been known for 40 years, you could work out why that was going on. And I came up with this concept of paradoxical B12 deficiency. The serum B12 levels were very high, but the markers that we were looking at show B12 deficiency. And this is a common thing with all of the kids that I've had with autism, all the ones that I had. So then I went back in the literature and you can see that about 40 years ago, autism wasn't very common, but B12 deficiency was a common thing about autism then, but it was absolute B12 deficiency. So it was where the mother clearly didn't need enough red meat or didn't have enough B12. And then you got the developmental delay, all of the speech problems and everything else that you associate with autism now. So then they, they said, well, clearly, if in absolute deficiency you can get the condition, then in this paradoxical B12 deficiency you should get the same. And so then we started, it was first with chronic fatigue and getting people out of chronic fatigue. And then later... People found me like you did through the web. Somehow they just found me, contacted me, um, and then we started from there. So it started with one, and then I've got about 2,000 now for autism. So that's quite a bit of data. They're all the same pretty much, but they're on a spectrum, as you would expect. I'm getting quite a bit faster at reading your notes. <laughs> Excellent. So much, Greg. I really just can't think of doing that. And hopefully, somehow we'll get the message out. Yes, that's that's what my hope in all of this is that more people are aware of it, that we can turn around this dramatic increase from, and drop it back to its one in a thousand from one in thirty. Because to the medical system, it's just huge. The cost of the you know the NDIS and these other things where the, these kids are going, and the parents believe that the child is never going to be cured. They get disability funding and the child is on for life. It's terrible. It's destructive to the family and the, and the child, you know, and it can be prevented. Yeah, and you're so right, as you've said on numerous occasions by email, that it's all about prevention and educating people, especially expectant mothers or even before you fall pregnant. And I just wish that I had known about you before I got pregnant, but um, 
you know, luckily I'm in a situation now where Con is much improved and it is really down to you and I can't thank you enough. And it's just something that I want other parents to be able to experience because, you know, it, the heartache of having a child with disability, it's very um, taxing. Thank you so much.